<laughs> Hello <laughs> and welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I will be giving general thoughts about the first two episodes of Amazon Prime's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, yes I still hate that title, and then go into a deep dive for both episode one and episode two, and we'll keep doing deep dives for each episode, at least for season one. I am so not committing to the entirety of this show, to be very clear, because no, <laughs> I didn't like what I saw. I legitimately thought I would be wrong, and it wouldn't be that bad overall, but it is actually worse than I expected. So kudos to Amazon for exceeding my expectations in this negative regard, I guess, because that was mildly impressive. First, I want to add a little something to what I talked about in my previous video on the subject of Amazon's of the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power TV show, in which I went into some of my expectations for the show and a little discussion about wokeism in media, to put it very simplistically. Thinking about something a booktube friend commented on one of my videos, I do find it interesting that for all this talk of female empowerment, representing differently coloured peoples, etc, etc, I've noticed a lot of SFF IPs that have been so far adapted were written by, you guessed it, I don't know about straight, but white men in any case. And don't get me wrong, some of the IPs that have been adapted and some that will be adapted in the future are favourites of mine. I don't think a book can't be good because it was written by a white man, far from it. But I'm like, if Hollywood is so gung-ho about progressivism and redressing inequalities in society, why aren't you lot adapting more works by A, female SFF authors and B, non-white SFF authors? Put your fucking money where your mouth is, is kind of my point. Ursula K. Le Guin, Octavia E. Butler, Robin Hobb, and hell, I'm going to argue Naomi Novik because she wrote a freaking series about the Napoleonic Wars with freaking dragons. You'd think that would be interesting to Hollywood. Three sources of SFF IPs you could exploit the crap out of written by either female authors or even female non-white authors. Right there. Just saying. Now again, I have learned that apparently N.K. Jemisin's The Broken Earth is being adapted. Good for her. Was not a fan of that trilogy, but good for her. And I will watch it if when it actually comes out. But apart from like a couple of exceptions, I'm sorry, but most SFF IPs that have been adapted from, you know, written novelized source material have been written by men. But then you have to modify their works to suit work politics for whatever reason. Anyway, I'm done with that specific aspect of this whole discussion. I just wanted to point that out because... I. Second bit of context and a fresh reminder that I consider myself a mid-tier talking, or I mean legendarium, nerd slash fan. I have read The Silmarillion this twice. She is my legendarium bae, she's my favourite, I love her, and she she was done dirty. Though I know they don't have the rights to this, but I'll come back to that. <laughs> I've read The Lord of the Rings once, I've read The Hobbit twice, I have read Unfinished Tales, The Children of Hurin, Baron and Luthien, and The Fall of Gondolin, and you know, have spent a fair few hours on legendarium wikis and whatnot. So those are my legendarium fan credentials, if you will. And I also place a lot of importance on whether or not an adaptation actually adapts and respects the source material. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one adaptation, of course, that's basically nearly impossible, but I do expect a minimum amount of respect and love for the source material, for its spirit, for its themes, for its character arcs, its story arcs, etc. This matters a lot to me. Now, I know there have been people so far who enjoy what they've seen of the show, and they think it doesn't really matter whether or not it respects Tolkien's source material, and they're just enjoying it as a fantasy IP. More power to them. However, you will not get this here with my Rings of Power deep dives. To me, Amazon brought this on themselves. They put the name The Lord of the Rings in their fucking series title. They put in their credits based on the writings of J.R.R. R. Tolkien, or I mean on his Lord of the Rings, and the appendices. They have brought this upon themselves, they have chosen to attach the name Tolkien and his works to their product, and I will judge them on that basis. If I believe they are failing as an adaptation, however loose, then I will say so, and it will affect my rating of this series. I'm not going to divorce the dude just what, because they get a free pass? They don't! They could have had the balls to create their own IP from scratch, no, they decided to write on the coattails of Tolkien's, you know, place in the history of SFF literature and the history of literature period. That's on them, and they don't get a cookie or a free pass from me just because oh, you should be able to enjoy your show on its own merits. No! 
And besides, I don't think the show so far is terribly good on its own merits either. Of course, I'll get into that. Now I'm going to jump into some general thoughts first. As I've probably already made it pretty clear, as an adaptation, garbage. Like, straight up garbage. It's on the level of, like, the Annihilation movie for me. So not quite as bad as Game of Thrones season 8. I mean, it wasn't even really an adaptation. Not as bad as the Aragorn movie. <laughs> Those are my metrics. But definitely as bad as uh, the movie Annihilation. The movie Annihilation wasn't actually bad if you consider it just as a cosmic horror movie. It's a garbage adaptation of the novel by Jeff Vandermeer and that's what I wanted to see so I was very pissed by that. Now actually I might even argue that those first two episodes weren't even that good as generic fantasy but it's about on that level for me from an adaptation point of view in any case. Writing wise I thought it was mediocre to bad. Those first two episodes were absolutely chock-a-block full of what I'll call cheap sounding aphorisms that try way too hard to sound deep, but actually sound dumb as fuck. I don't know, I guess they were trying to emulate Tolkien's pro style, which is quite specific, and that was about to fail, like, re-watching the episode, I was like, this is actually really freaking stupid, though. There were a couple of things that were okay to mildly good, but most of it, mediocre to outright bad. Kind of the same goes for the acting, as far as I'm concerned, I was not impressed. Like, honestly, I thought what I got in The Wheel of Time, the first season of The Wheel of Time, was better overall. I guess the performance by the actor who does Arondia, the dark-skinned elven gentleman, sylvan elven gentleman, I think. I guess he did have that solemnity you would associate with an elf, so that was kind of alright. Elrond at times I thought had an interesting delivery, but a lot of the times I kind of just wanted to slap him, slap that smug look off his face. I'm sorry if that sounds mean, but I was like, just shut up. <laughs> Gil Galad was, uh, pfft, just whatever. Keller Brimble, uh, but I mean, that's not so much a question of performance as the looks of the actors, but I'll go into that in the deep dive. And Galadriel, I'm just, nope. J just straight up nope, though. Like, no. I, no, this is not Galadriel, just nope. So far. I'll have to keep repeating this. So far, it's only two episodes in. So far, this is not Galadriel. I'm like, nope. Nobody, nope, nope. And Bronwyn, whatever. <laughs> just that romance is just like, whatever. I don't, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about anyone so far because the law butchering is just, oh, it's just so bad. Now, yes, visually it is stunning, though not perfect either. Some of the CGI at times is a bit, it's all right. Like that ice troll in the beginning. Yeah, fine. Yes, the beautiful panoramic shots and, you know, landscapes and it's quite majestic and obviously trying to get those echoes from Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings and to be legendary me. And those are pretty, yes, but for fuck's sake, they spent, what, near to a billion dollars on this? That's kind of the bare minimum at this point and I'm sorry but it's not good enough. I need more than just it's pretty it's shiny for me to consider it good. And the music, the, the music is again pretty. Some themes feel legendary me to me, others don't at all and I felt they didn't fit. In fact I was reminded of a theme from Foundation of all things, that was really jarring, and some notes reminded me of Harry Potter. <laughs> I'm like, what? Look, it's a me thing. I'm I'm very weird about music and I have an excellent musical memory. So I just got these echoes and I was like, this, this is not the legendarium. What the fuck? So that's a bit strange for me, but I guess it was fine. And that intro montage you get in the second episode was kind of whatever. Honestly, I think I prefer the one for the Wheel of Time at this point. It was fine, but nothing... Nothing noteworthy, I guess. I mean, I maintain that the intro montage we have for Game of Thrones is still one of the greatest ever made, if not the greatest ever made. I wasn't expecting that, but it's just a bit meh, these little grains of sand making... S I mean, the symbols and the patterns were cool, I guess, nice. But meh. Plot-wise, I mean, I mean, besides the lore butchering, some of the plot elements were just like, what? The whole thing with Galadriel jumping into the sea? <laughs> Than coming across that raft. I'm <laughs> sorry, it was stupid. Like, it was straight up stupid. I laughed. Like, I couldn't take that seriously. I'm like, come on, really? What? You were <laughs> supposed to swim across the ocean? What the? <laughs> the pacing, I didn't mind so much. Some people were bored and thought the pacing was slow, but I mean, parts of the Legendarium's writing is kind of slow paced as well. So, that to me is not an issue. That would actually be respecting the Legendarium corpus in a way. So, I don't have an issue with that, but the plot itself is like, 
Okay. I mean, it's a lot of setup. It's two hours of setup and I'm like, since I'm being distracted by how garbage the adaptation aspect is, by the plot weirdness, by the bad characterization, the bad writing, it's like, pfft. it was tedious. I had to rewatch those episodes to take notes for my deep dives. I didn't want to. I was, I was dreading it. I kept taking breaks and going on Reddit to read comments instead because I was like, oh, this is tedious and this is bad. I don't want to do this. But um, I prevailed for the channel. <laughs> Also, the discourse around this on the internet. Oh, if you're familiar with that gif of Michael Jackson eating popcorn avidly, that's my mindset when I go on Reddit around this stuff. It was just, mm, oh, this, this is entertaining. This is more entertaining than the actual show. So now I'll be getting into the deep diving for both episode one and two. And then after that, I'll probably do a deep dive by episode. I will be snarky because I just can't otherwise. I will be taking the piss in some places, but I will also be fair where fairness is warranted. If I like something, I will say so. So this isn't going to be complete trashing, though. Like I said, I didn't like this and I have so many issues, <laughs> like, wow. So we start episode one with this little opening scene of child Galadriel making a paper boat. I did notice that that paper boat looked a bit like a swan, so I was like, is that supposed to be a, you know, little nod to the swan ships at Alcolondi? Maybe? Okay, and she gets bullied by a group of kid elves. Apparently this is kind of a trope, also the bullied female who becomes kind of a bitch afterwards. <laughs> Whatever. And it's just like, no, I, my boat is not going to float, it's going to sail. And I'm like, same difference, but all right. Then her big bro shows up, big bro Finrod, and first thing I notice, the haircut. This is going to be a recurring complaint. Is it petty? Is it nitpicky? The former, I'm not sure. The latter, yes, but I am a nitpicky bitchworm. You know this about me, so I'm sorry, but I'm not going to give a pass to that. That haircut, what the actual fuck? What was that haircut? I'm sorry, that's not Finrod to me. No. Like, it's not even a generic, I don't know, 1950s haircut. It's like a haircut from 2021, you know, the thing where you shave the sides. I hate that haircut for men, no offense to those who like it, but I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> so, okay, that was already bad. Also, Galadriel apparently only has one brother. In fact, she has three of them, but perhaps that fell under the thing we can't touch IP-wise. But I'm really confused about this, because they say they can't touch the Silmarillion stuff, but... <laughs> I'll get back to that. And so Galadriel, her paper boat gets smashed in the water. She punches the kid. Big bro comes along and says, all right, let's calm down all you kids. And then they have a little, you know, chat under a nice looking tree. And they have the most stupid sounding exchange about rocks looking down to the ocean and boats looking up at the sky. And this is where I was like, you're trying to sound deep with this, but it's actually moronic if you think about it for more than two seconds. But philosophizing from the elves in Valinor. Yay. He also says, I won't always be here. And I'm like, how do you know that, dude? Did you see into the future? Do you know you're gonna die in Middle Earth? And then she says, I mean, she narrates the intro, right? Oh, there's so many things that they tried to lift out of, like, Fellowship. It was so bloody obvious to me trying to, you know, echo that first movie, like the narration by Galadriel at the beginning of Fellowship. So they had to have that at the beginning of episode one of Rings of Power, of course. So adult Galadriel is narrating this and she says, we didn't yet have a word for death. Except there is a word for, there's several words for death, in fact, in Quenya. And I'm like, surely the elves had a concept for things dying because they knew they couldn't die. They were immortal. Their fate, their longevity as a species is tied to the fate of Arda. I mean, they lived alongside animals and shit. Surely they knew they died. So of course they had a word for death. Just whatever. <laughs> then you give in this beautiful shot of Tyrion, the elven capital in Valinor. Of course, they don't actually mention it by name because I assume they can't. And you see the two trees and they're quite beautiful. I will give them that. It's a very beautiful shot. It's majestic. It's full of light. Yes, it was nice. You do see Laurelin and Helperion. Of course, they're not mentioned by name. And then the law butchering really starts in earnest. So she basically says that Morgoth comes in, fucks shit up with the two trees. No Ungoliant. Where was my main spider? Ungoliant. Big Mama Golly, as I'm calling her. You could show the two trees, not name them, but you couldn't be asked to put in a giant ass spider and not name her or give her a different name? You could have just said Morgoth took the shape of a spider, which would not be completely lore accurate, but still better than just Morgoth burned the trees and melted them. I'm like, no, Ungoliant sapped the life strength out of those trees. Like, big OG Mama spider. <laughs> also, fun fact, I learned that. 
<laughs> Tolkien grew up in South Africa and he got bitten by a big spider, I assume. So I'm like, I understand now you have big villains who are big spiders. That makes sense. No mention of the Silmarils, no mention of Feanor, the Oath of Feanor. The elves just leave. There is no mention of the Kinsling and Arcolondi. There's no mention of the crossing of the Helcaraxi, which uh, Galadriel was a part of. Then they just take ships and go to Middle Earth. No mention of Beleriand, of course. I guess that they could not touch. And they go fight Morgoth because he's just evil. Oh, and he melted the trees. And they start having wars. And you see this shot of like one of the wars, I guess at the beginning of the conflict with Morgoth, and you see fell beasts from Peter Jackson's movies and eagles, but no balrogs, no dragons. I, I guess dragons hadn't been created yet, but so why fell beasts? Fell beasts, but not the great worms. And then you do see that shot from the trailer with Galadriel just picking up a helmet and shoving it on the big pile of helmets. I'm like, it was in fact the Battle of Anumba Tears or the War of Wrath. I mean, was Galadriel even supposed to be there though? I mean, also she's in a super clean white dress. Everyone else is dirty around her just shuffling about the battlefield, just saying. She was supposed to be in Doriath, studying under Malian the Maya at some point. I'm like, what are you doing there, mate? And then they go for this narrative that Sauron raised a big army of orcs. That was a bit confusing too. So the orcs multiplied before or just right after Morgoth was defeated. And I was like, what? I went back to check this. Sauron wasn't even at the end of the War of Wrath because he gets defeated by Luthien and Huan, or I mean, Huan more so, the dog. And then he kind of scampers off and hides for a long while. He actually kind of tries to repent. I mean, he doesn't go back to Valinor to face the wrath of the Valar and that judgment. He kind of scampers off and just kind of disappears for a while. So this whole thing about Finrod being killed by him, I mean, that's a nitpick, sure, but it's part of so many nitpicks, it just makes it, you know, a huge problem with law butchering. Finrod wasn't killed by Sauron. Finrod was a captive of Sauron and got killed by one of his werewolves. So this whole revenge arc narrative is just, huh? it's just, no, but but no. I mean, and besides the fact it's not law accurate, it's just so poorly set up. You're supposed to care about this brother-sister relationship you see five seconds of at the very beginning. And it's like, oh my God, my brother died. I'm going to spend a millennia chasing Sauron. I mean, really though? I mean, she sounds a bit like Feanor. So to me, they kind of like injected Feanor's character arc into Galadriel because he was obsessed with getting his Silmarils back, which fucked shit up for a lot of elves. So now she's like knock off Feanor, obsessed with getting Sauron who didn't actually kill her brother. Also her brother got resurrected in Valinor, like basically all elves because they don't die for good. I mean, most of them stay in the halls of Mandos, at least the ones who left with the Noldorin. He got <laughs> permission to get out, so he's resurrected and chilling in Valinor. He's just having a good time. And, I mean, she should know this. She was born in Valinor. She should know this. It's just... Uh... And so Finrod's body gets marked by the Zodiac Killer equivalent in this TV series of Sauron's Mark. <laughs> and each time you see Sauron's Mark, you get the flashback you get with basically Frodo touching the ring or a Palantir in Peter Jackson's movie. You get this big flash of red and woo, and you, you hear the whispers, and it, it, they're basically copying what happens when you touch the ring or a palantir. That's what it is. And then she goes on this big trek with a a SWAT team, is what I call it. The Elven SWAT team goes into the north to Fordwaith because Sauron is supposed to be there for reasons. They go into the big cave, there's an ice troll, she sees the sign on this frozen table thing, pours water on it, fire doesn't burn apparently because there's so much evil that it cools the fire, so you can touch it and not burn. This is going to be a recurring motif, by the way. Pours water on the table, the mark steams but freezes at the same time because magic, I suppose. She also smashes a wall of ice, kind of like I wanted to smash the screen of my computer at one point. So then they battle a nice troll and she's basically an overpowered dex build, not a magic user as she should be given she has trained under Melian the Maya in magic, uh, but whatever. The ice troll knocks everyone about, but of course she being faux feminist, female badass, trademark warrior princess Galadriel, she <sighs> KOs him in five seconds. Just the whole jumping off the sword thing Look, look bad. Just no, just have a regular sword fight or something. That was just, uh, no. Also, I should mention that Celeborn is nowhere in sight. Calabrian is nowhere in sight. They should already be there, but no, I guess that would hamper the strong female, strong female narrative they got going for Galadriel. And then you introduce to the 
hobbits, <coughs> sorry, halffoots. They all have Irish accents. So I was wrong. <laughs> Lenny Henry wasn't actually meant to sound like a West Countryman. He was meant to sound Irish. So bad Irish accents? Diversity, skin color wise, cool, though it's not even applied consistently, but I'll get back to that. But somehow it's cool to have all the halffoots have an Irish accent and all the dwarves a Scottish one. Not always a good one, mind you, but still. Also, I'm like, you have these hobbit, the, the halffoot, sorry. Um, they're supposed to be like the, the cute relief and the comic relief. I was like, whatever. They're clumsy, they bump around, but they're dirty and grimy as fuck. What is up with that? Why are they such dirty bums? <laughs> I was trying to justify legitimately in my head, like find their ancestral hobbits so they could be the hunter-gatherer stage of hobbits. But I'm like, even human hunter-gatherers aren't necessarily like dirty and grimy with leaves in their hair all the time like what this one girl poppy of course you got knock off frodo and samwise because gotta echo those peter jackson movies even though we said we wouldn't be doing that so you have those two and like poppy has these leaves in her head that look like mini antlers and i was like eh, what i don't know it's kind of a parody of hobbits in a way you know what i mean i didn't find that cute i found that <sighs> disappointing a bit silly but i mean fine you know wh whatever so we got the knockoff hobbits Yay! What's her name? Nori and Poppy, they go out to eat berries, and then you've got a war, I suppose, is what that was on the cliffside who didn't attack them because reasons, and oh, there's a footsie on the ground, ooh, there's a wolf, E, we're scared, we're going back to the village, oh, you shouldn't have gone out, yeah, you shouldn't have gone out, but adventurous hobbit, because gotta emulate the foursome from Fellowship, am I right? Then you move on to Linden where you meet Elrond for the first time. Now again, I know I'm a bit of a broken record with this, but um, what's up with that haircut? <laughs> it's not even the right color hair either, and I'm like, you people spent almost a billion dollars on this thing. You could be bothered to get him a wig, the right color. And he's in a tree writing a speech, and he's not allowed to attend the Elven Council, and I'm like, but why though? Because he's half Elvish? But that's not even stated so far in the series, so... Huh? And then he's told Galadriel is back. Oh yay, my friend is back. And I'm like, Galadriel is way older than Elrond. She's also like Gil-Galad's aunt. These two should be paying her way more respect and deference than they actually do. But then again, she kind of acts like an uppity and obnoxious bitch at the same time. So... <laughs> I kind of understand their attitude there, though she shouldn't be portrayed that way as far as I'm concerned. So they have a bit of an exchange. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Tell me about your travels. <laughs> You're trying to play me like a politician. Like, bitch, why are you so mean to him? He's legitimately trying to be nice to you and asking how your travels went. Like, what is your problem? And no, can't see Gilgalad. He's angry with you. You disobeyed his orders. I'm like, is he even in a position to give her orders though? And so then you get this like honors ceremony orchestrated by Gilgalad. Why does Gilgalad's cape clothing thing have runes on it? Dwarven runes. See, that's the kind of detail that matters to me because these things matter for immersion and just these little nods of respect to the law. And it's like they couldn't be even asked to get that right. Why the fuck does the hiking of the elves have runes on his cape? And then Galadriel and her SWAT team are rewarded with a boat ticket to Valinor. And I'm like, what? Gil Galad is not in a position to reward elves with going back to Valinor. It's a birthright of the fucking elves. Most of the ones remaining in Middle Earth in the Second Age want to be there. But otherwise, they're perfectly free to go back to Valinor. Valinor is still accessible as a physical land. The curvature of the earth, the magic thing, has not happened yet. It's not a prize to be awarded by the High King. What? That's just a basic law thing that did not need to be included, for fuck's sake. Just what? And then you have a display of magical fireworks, and I'm like, yep, that's a callback to Bilbo's birthday in Fellowship. And then you have this exchange between Galadriel and Elrond in this foresty, temple-y place with wooden statues of fallen elves. I do think you kind of see Luthien and Juan at one point, actually. Maybe. And of course, uh, Finrod with the ridiculous haircut. And this, just the weirdest exchange, Galadriel going on about, I thought I would rest here with my fallen family members or something. And I'm like, but no, you're an elf? 
You know how your world fucking works? If you die in Middle Earth, your soul is yeeted back to Valinor, then you get reincarnated, more or less. Your brother Finrod is not resting in Middle Earth, his soul, his body is back in Valinor. Like I said, he's chilling in Tyrion in all probability. What the fuck is she on about? This is like basic aspects of the Legendarium's world building and lore. Like, they couldn't even get that right. The elves are... So I mean, they can die, but it's not a real death. They are immortal. Their fate is tied to that of Ada. Mortality is the gift given to human beings by the great creator god Iluvatar. What the fuck? This is not just a nitpick. This is a core aspect of the Legendarium. But no, no, because emotionality, trying to care for Galadriel and her stupid revenge arc? No, fuck that. And then... She says, you have not seen what I have seen to Elrond. I have to say that props to the actor, she does know how to convey anger and annoyance. I mean, so far not much else. I mean, Galadriel's kind of an obnoxious bitch so far, but she, she does know how to do angry face. I will give her that. And I'm like, again, Galadriel, you're talking to Elrond. Elrond lost basically his entire fucking family. He was raised by Feanorians, I, if I recall correctly. He's seen some shit. Like, he's lost so many people. His brother aligned with humanity and went off to Numenor. He's like all alone there. He has seen shit. Perhaps not exactly as much as you, because you're older. You saw the skin slaying in Arcolonde, you crossed the Helcraxi. You kind of lived through the entire war with Morgoth. But it's not as if <laughs> Elrond have this golden childhood with no hardship. Like, what the- Again, what the fuck? Why are you being such a bitch to him? I don't get it. Why are they going for this characterization? It's awful. And then we switch. If I understood this correctly, if I got this wrong, please do tell me in the comments, but they go to Harad? Did I get that right? They go to Haradrim village, where we meet an occupation force of sylvan elves who answer to the High King Gilgalad. What are they doing there? Why Sylvan Elves with, the, you know, the armor? I think the armor was all right. The costuming overall was just very mixed for me, but that was all right, I guess. You introduced to Rondi again. Why with the short hair? Just, oh, fuck's sake. Otherwise, I will give him this. Again, credit where credit is due. Decent portrayal of Elven solemnity, I guess. Kind of. Though the whole romance they're trying to establish between him and Bronwyn. Oh, come on. It's so forced. It's just no! <laughs> to have Bronwyn, the Haradrim healer, who is white. Can we just take a moment here to note she is white? Like, literally, you have an in world, law accurate opportunity to have an entirely darker skinned people in Harad. <laughs> but there you have white Haradrim, and the main Haradrim character is white. I'm sorry, but that to me was fucking hilarious. It's like, you people can't even apply your diversity policy well enough in a way that actually makes sense. Because also they mix in people everywhere, except the High Elves, the Noldorin, they're all white. Why not darker skinned people among them? But then the Haradrim who could be all dark skinned, that would actually be law accurate, more law accurate than this. <laughs> the MC is it's just okay moving on from that their romance at times you know the acting felt forced to me it felt like overacting you're just trying so hard to make it poignant to inject gravitas into this and it just fails it just no i couldn't feel their love and like oh, but i don't want to leave you when you're the only one who has shown me kindness i can't tell you i love you but i showed you that in every way that isn't words and <laughs> Okay, and the tears, and it's like, mm. I mean, again, like, it's not, it's not like, you know, elf human romances are very lore significant in the legendarium, just brushing that aside. <laughs> but there's even another elf who says, you know, only twice before have there been elvish human pairings, and it, they all ended in tragedy, and I'm like, no, they didn't? Baron and Luthien lived together, like in Osirian, I think, in Beleriand. They lived together, they had a child, raised it, and then they were like this old happy couple, and they lived together until the end of their days, and they died together, and it was like pretty peaceful, actually, compared to a lot of other shit that happened <laughs> during the elder days. I'm like, no, it's actually a, a happy love story. What? So, again, I, I don't get it, because they're not even mentioning who those people were, but it all ended in a tragedy. No, it didn't! It literally didn't, though! Like, okay, then you, so you see Galadriel and her SWAT team on a boat to Valinor. Oh, don't expect to see, well, Numenor you'll see later, but don't expect to see Tall Eresia, because that's 
that doesn't exist apparently. <laughs> I'm like, they're all standing, very solemn looking, holding their swords. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> did they stand like that on that boat during the entire voyage? <laughs> Because I'm sorry, what is, uh, what's it called again? The, the Sundering Sea. Like, is it supposed to be as, as wide as the Atlantic or something? Like, how long did they stand like that? Six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours? That, just, that was funny to me. And, and you're introduced to Calabrimbor and I'm like, oh, hell no. He doesn't look right. I'm sorry, he looks too, I guess... Now he will be accused of ageism too. He looks too old. His haircut, I'm sorry, but that's a L'Oreal for men ad. It's not an elf. My mum was like, he looks like an English banker from the city. I would have gone with that, but that was her opinion. I'm just, no, not so long Calibrin at all. And so back to the boat. They're being undressed, divested of their armor for whatever reason, because you need to be in your nighty to get to Valinor. Apparently, that whole scene just felt so fucking culty to me though. Like, what the hell? This whole thing with going to Valinor, you have the clouds parting and this wall of ethereal heavenly light and I'm like, Valinor is a physical place? It has a shoreline? What? It's not this other dimension of light. What the F? To me, it looked like aliens were about to come down and abduct a lot of them. Like, what the fuck? And with them undressing, it just felt like this weird religious culty thing. That was not necessary. However, again, credit where credit is due. The singing felt kind of legendary. That sounds like something Tolkien would put in, right? Because there are songs and poems and shit in the legendarium. So that I didn't have an issue with. But the whole going into the light thing. They're not about to die. The Valinor is a physical place. Again, just you're not even trying here. And then you have this comet going over all the main players we've been introduced to. Again, credit where credit is your. I mean, it's not a question of credit, but I like that. You kind of see for two seconds a little Ent family. And I was like, oh, that's cute. <laughs> Mama Ent. Papa end and baby end. And I'm like, oh, it's before the ends lost their wise. That's cute. So points, one point for cute ant family. Yes, I will give them that. And then finally, Galadriel's all like, I don't want to go into the light. She's thinking about that conversation she had as a little girl with her brother. And her brother's like, you can't know which light to choose until you've touched the darkness. And then she's like, fuck this. And she yeets herself off the boat into the ocean because that is very intelligent. So before that, also, echo to Fellowship, there's this shot of her, this close-up of her face, illuminated in ethereal light, exactly like the shot of Galadriel in Fellowship, where she's tempted by the ring and you see her in full white light, a close-up of her face, of Kate Blanchett's face. So I was like, copy-pasting that as well. And then she, she jumps into the water, because apparently she's Galadriel Phelps. <laughs> No, so the episode actually ends with the little hobbit girls, young women, Nori and Poppy coming across Meteor Man or Comet Man. Because there was a dude in that Comet Meteor thing. He naked, except for loincloth, and he's in a pit of fire. And so that's where episode two opens up. You got little Nori going into the pit of fire because apparently in Rings of Power, fire doesn't actually burn. Like she's stepping on coals and shit, but no, no burns. So fire doesn't work like it should, apparently. <laughs> Pokes the dude because that's also very intelligent. How hasn't she died already being so reckless? One wonders. And then much screaming ensues. So it's like, she's like, Wah! because he wakes up and she's like, Whoa! and then her friend shows up and she's like, what are you doing? I'm going to tell your mom. No, don't tell my mom. And, and then they try to <laughs> take him along, shove him in a kind of wheelchair thing or wheelbarrow and bring him to a place. And there's this comic relief moment where the wheelbarrow goes away and they're like, no, no, we got to catch it. And then they put him in this little hut type thing and leave him there wondering, what is this giant? It's not a human. It's not an elf. What is it? And then we cut back to Arondir and Bronwyn, who I forgot to say this. Yeah, I mean, they're trying to investigate where the cow got the bad food that made her, you know, produce black sludge out of her udders. And they come across this little village and there's this whole thing with Arondir saying, you people were lied with Morgoth in the battle days of the elder days and Bronwyn was like no but did my friends and my family were good people and then they arrive at this village that's been burned to the ground with holes in the ground and shit she didn't seem that upset to me at like losing the entirety of the village where she was born okay and then there's also again this solemn moment of like I'm going to jump into that hole Arondia's gonna jump to the hole so Galadriel jumped into the ocean Arondia jumps into the hole because intelligence. And she's like, no, no, don't go into the hole. And so I must, I must go into the hole. Because of course, I suppose. And you know, they make big googly eyes at one another. <laughs> it's like, no kissing, no smoochy smooch smooch. 
<laughs> I told you, I took the piss out of this quite a bit. And then Elrond is supposed to help Calabrimbor with his project. Project being the forging of the rings. You're not told this yet, but um, that's what it's going to be. And they go to Region together. And then Elrond sees Feanor's hammer, and they fucking mention Feanor, and then they fucking mention the Silmarils. What the? Just why then? Why can you? Why can you mention this in the intro in episode one? If you're allowed to mention Fanor and the fucking Summers and the fact more goth stole them, then why didn't you put that in the intro and give that as the reason why the elves left Valinor in the first fucking place? It's just don't fucking at me with oh they couldn't touch the Silmarillion material. Obviously they can touch some things. So why did they go out of their way to butcher the law like this in the intro? Why did they deviate so much from the source material if they can mention this shit in episode two? It makes no fucking sense to me. So anyway, that was mentioned. And, and then Keller Brimble says like Morgoth could have been swayed to repent of his evil ways through the Silmarils. And I'm like, no, he didn't. No, like that never happened. Morgoth was like, I want the light for myself. I want to be big honcho god and spite the original god and all the light is mine and I'm gonna fuck shit up. That's it. He never considered, oh, this is such pretty light from the trees in those jewels and I'm gonna be a good person now. That never fucking, <laughs> that never happened, all right? Just like, okay. And also just Calabrimble, the, <laughs> I mean, that's not so much an issue, just like, what an arrogant bastard, like, I don't want to play around with these, you know, little trifles, these little jewels things. I mean, they only contain the light of the two trees, but I, <laughs> you want to make your powerful rings? You do that. And then Elrond going, again, but this is just adding salt to the wound. Elrond going, oh, those jewels, so much beauty in them and so much pain. Yeah, no shit, bitch, the War of the Silmarils. Hello, you know about this, like, you were born at the end of it, again. If you can mention this shit, why it wasn't in the intro? Literally, why? And then we go to Casa Doom. And apparently it's five minutes away from Eregion because no horses and they don't look travel worn, Calabrimbor and Elrod at all. So just a five minute walk down the road, apparently. He's big buds with Durin, gonna have a little chat, going to convince them of, you know, constructing a nice little forge for us. But nope, access denied. And then he's like, Calabrimbor, like, let me deal with this shit. I'm, I'm the diplomat here. You go back to Region, which is apparently, again, five minutes up the road. And then he goes into Casa Doom. Now, again, credit where credit is due. Casa Doom looked stunning. I will give them that. Now you introduce the dwarves. Not a single beard on a single female dwarf. Not one. Like, not one. And you see several female dwarves, I might add, not a single one. Though I did notice, you know, a kind of armor with, like, boobs on it. Like, the kind of shit you see in an RPG aimed at male players, like for real though. So, uh, boobed armor, cool. Beards on female dwarves, that's just, again, that's too much. That's too progressive, I guess. That's too gender non-conforming. Oh, just, oh, sod off though. Like, talk about low effort, literally. Again, it's those little details though. Again, race swapping or co skin color swapping, that's totes cool. Even though they kind of do it in a weird way, even according to... That was just funny to me. Beards on female dwarves. No, that's going too far though. That's too much. That is too much. Bullshit. And then we pop back to Galadriel Phelps. Um, first off, I'm sorry. First she's like, apparently she's been like floating in the sea until nightfall, looking at the stars. And then she's like, oh, maybe I should start swimming now. She starts swimming. I'm sorry, it was so fucking stupid. Come on, can we just all admit it was so bloody stupid. Was she supposed to swim all the way back to Middle Earth? Like, really? Of course, conveniently, she, you know, encounters a raft with survivors from know, some kind of shipwreck. And at first, <laughs> a woman, nice woman, says, we got to help her. She's also, you know, drift at sea. And the other people I know, we don't know her, blah, blah, blah. You've got also the main human bro, Holbrand. He's like, well, well, well. We don't know. She's like, things aren't, aren't always what they seem. They bring her on board and then, oh my god, she's got elf ears. She bad. And then they're all conflicted about it. And then they talk about the worm. Now again, point for using the word worm. Old English word for dragon. I approve. A sea worm. Big one too. <laughs> big, big beastie. So sea worm wants a snack. Apparently. <laughs> First of all, they're like, be still. And I'm like, the thing is underwater. <laughs> I was like, is this supposed to be a Jurassic Park T-Rex? <laughs> Sorry, but okay, be still. <laughs> it swims straight for them. And the woman who took Galadriel out of the water just yeets her off the raft. 
<laughs> in two seconds. But I'm sorry, that was fucking hilarious. I was just, what just happened? Am I supposed to be finding this humorous as much as I am? I don't think so. I don't think that's the intent of the script writers. I'm sorry, that shit was hilarious. It's like one minute she's like, no, we've got to help her. Bitch, get off. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just too fucking funny. Like, okay, well, <laughs> so much for that. And then she's in the water, Galadriel, with a little knife thing, a little dagger. Were you just expecting to slay this thing one-handed in the water, for real? But then big sea worm thing chomps on the people on the raft. Had a nice snacky. Had a head kind of like a kaiju, but anyway. <laughs> so it has its snack, then conveniently disappears, of course. And then Galadriel goes back on the raft where Halbrand survived because of course. And then they exchange a bit of convo banter. There have been orcs in my land and I've been chased away from my land because orcs. Galadriel's like, mm, orcs, do tell me more. I want to kill the orcs and the leader of the orcs and I've seen strife and I've seen so many people I care about die. I understand your pain and your grief. And at this point I was like, since you people obviously don't give a single fuck about, you know, the legendarium or law accuracy, I was like, just have them start fucking on the raft. Just throw some tits and ass a la HBO in this bitch at this point. Like, make it at least a bit more entertaining. They could just started having full-on sex on that run. <laughs> Because they kind of had some chemistry. I, I will give them that. I like their exchange more so than I did Arondi and Bronwyn's. I was like, Galadriel, since apparently you're not married in this fan fiction and don't have a child, might as well get some, some human ass. Am I right? <laughs> but last note, no fucking ensued. Oh well. <laughs> and then back to what's his face? Elrond. So he has this whole rock breaking contest with Durin. And Durin exposes what the rock breaking contest is to the dwarves who presumably know what the rock breaking contest is all about. I saw this critique from someone else. There's a lot of telling when the showing would suffice an exposition given to people who would already know about the exposition. So basically badly executed exposition. Anyway, so Durin explains this and they smash some rocks. Of course, Elrond falters at one point. He's like exhausted and cannot smash any more rocks. And then you learn that apparently Durin was miffed at Elrond because Elrond didn't attend his wedding. Okay, fine. So he, he didn't attend his his bud's wedding, nor did he attend the birth of his two children. So after that, Elrond meets Durin's wife, Disa, and she's like, no, no, stay, you're a guest, and blah, blah, blah. And then they, they have this exchange, and you really hurt my feelings by not coming to my wedding. I thought we were friends, and 20 years passed, and that's nothing for you, Elf, but for me, it's a lifetime. And I'm like, I mean, no, dwarves live long lives too, but okay. And then they have these stupid lines, and it's like, that's the thing I said about dumb fuck aphorisms that really aren't deep. Like at one point Durin says, a dog may bark at the moon but can't bring it down. I'm like, okay. And then Elrond references a tree that grew out of a seed he gifted Durin or some shit and he's like, where there is love there can be no darkness. And I'm like, oh bro, it's not that deep. Just, oh, come on. No, just, just not. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's not good writing. It just isn't. And again, with the playing fast and loose with the law and what you can and can't mention because Disa at one point goes Aule's beard by Aule's beard and I'm like you don't yourself have a beard but okay Aule is like the Vulcan of the Tolkien mythology he's a Valar he's a kind of god responsible for smithing and mountains and stuff and he created the dwarves because the dwarves are not one of Eru Iluvatar's children like the elves and humans are so you can reference Aule a Valar but again, you fucked up that intro so bloody bad and just shat all over the law and the world building. Okay, I don't get it, but all right, fine. So Aule's beard. So Aule can be mentioned, but I suppose Melian can't be mentioned, or I don't know, Yavanna or Varda or whatever. Just, oh, I, oh, it just pisses me off. Then we're back to the humans in Harad. And so Theo has been complaining about mice under his floorboards, and then he just goes ape shit with the mice and starts, I mean, ripping his floorboards up with a fire poker because that's a totally rational reaction to thinking you have mice under your floorboards. I guess he has anger issues. <laughs> and then of course he makes a hole in the floor and what should poke out but an eye and he freaks out because guess what? Yes, there's an orc down there and you've got a rondier going into creepy tunnels and they're creepy things in the creepy tunnels. I'm like, again with the stupidity that why are they making these characters act like abject morons? I'm glad you're jumping into the ocean because apparently she can swim that distance. Arondia just jumping into a hole and into these creepy tunnels. There are orcs down there, obviously, and then at one point he's like in this little watery area and he gets yoinked. 
<laughs> backwards by claws and shit. I suppose we'll see him again in the next episode. Bronwyn goes back to her little healer's hut and she sees absolute chaos in her hut. Like everything's just fucked up, tables overturned, chairs destroyed, the floorboards completely ripped out, and Theo's like, there's a, there's a monster thing, and then instead of going out to call for help, I mean, I guess she doesn't want to abandon her kid, I can kind of get it. She hides into a closet, though, what does she think she's going to accomplish by doing that? And then the orc shows up. The orc was well done. Again, credit where credit is due. And of course, the orc ends up yoinking Bronwyn out of the closet. A scuffle ensues. It dies. <laughs> it dies. <laughs> Short of it is it dies, it gets killed, and then Bronwyn takes the head back to the tavern and says, See? Bad things. We gotta get out of here. At first light. <laughs> Everything happens at first light in the series, you should know. Yes, they all go away though. All going to go to the Elven Tower. Kind of like all the people, you know, leaving Rohan to go to Helmsteep. <laughs> Just saying. So that's that. And then finally we come back to Galadriel and Hullbrand on their raft. A big, you know, storm comes up. So Galadriel ties herself to a kind of mast, like Ulysses apparently, but then lightning bolt, whee, into the water, and she starts sinking. And she's passed out. From what I could tell, like she's passed out. Hotbrand dives after her, frees her from the rope, binding her to this piece of wood. Then she emerges fully conscious, not even, you know, an ounce of water in her lungs. No, no, she's completely fine and they climb back on the raft and it's all good. They survived the storm. Basically at the end, you see Galadriel and Hullbrand on the raft. The sun is out and they see a shadow fall across them and Galadriel looks up and there's a ship and a person on the ship. And obviously this is a Numenorean ship. Like this is what it's going to be. And she's like, oh, say, oh God, this was so bad and tedious. I'm just, no, no, no. The law butchering is just staggering in this thing. And it's like, yes, you have to change things for adaptations, but this isn't an adaptation in any way, shape or form. I don't care about the, we don't have much material to draw on excuse. You still chose to put Tolkien's name on this thing and to put the Lord of the Rings name in your fucking series title. So I'm gonna judge you on those metrics, sue me. Plus again, they do mention Silmarillion things. They could have made an intro that was somewhat lore accurate, but no, why? Literally white and Galadriel is like, again, badass female warrior. Oh, whoopee freaking dude. She's a bitch, honestly, at this point. She's like angry, obnoxious, uppity. A bitch. I'm like, okay, cool. She's angry. But also she they made her a dex build, is what I'm calling it. She should be an overpowered magic user. They both managed to make her a Mary Sue and to nerf her. That's a feat in and of itself because she trained on the freaking Malian the Maya. She should be extremely overpowered with magic by this point in her story. No, instead they make her this angry leader of a SWAT team who's like ninja-esque in her swordplay. Fucking yay. So basically what, we're gonna copy paste a hybrid of a Brienne of Tarth and Ninja Arya from the Game of Thrones show? Is, is that what we're going with here? Oh, yippee. <laughs> Elrond is fine, but kind of weak. Elrond is sullen, but a bit wooden at times. The romance with Bronwyn, wow, just whatever. The hobbits are kind of cute. Oh yeah, sorry about that. I forgot that. There's this whole thing of like, Nori trying to take care of this dude. <laughs> Obviously a magic user. By the end of that episode, he talks to fireflies and I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, if that's Gandalf, I'm going to be so pissed. Leave Gandalf out of this, please. But it's like talking to fireflies. You remember when he talks to a moth in Fellowship? Does that ring a bell? And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. Don't have it be Gandalf, please. Please don't have it be Gandalf. If they make it a blue wizard, I'd be a lot more fine with that. But if it's fucking Gandalf, I swear to... <sighs> Must stay calm. Just straight up, no. And the amount of just stupid, the amount of stupid stupid in the writing and the plotting so far and that these are just the first two episodes on the one hand that means room for improvement but i'm like this is how you hook in your audience some people seem to like it and again more power to them but for this nerd no hell no like honestly i don't want to watch the rest of it but i will because i've decided to do a deep dive of season one for my channel but honestly if it doesn't significantly approve by the end i'm just chucking this thing in the bin like oh Fuck no. Like, talk about shitting on a beloved work of fiction. Again, I honestly expected I would be somewhat wrong in my expectations. I would be alright. Perhaps not good, but alright. It was actually bad. It was actually worse than I expected. <laughs> 
the baby end. So silver linings, baby end. I know we're gonna see a Balrog at one point, so yeah, I guess. Okay, um, and we're gonna see Numenor in the next episode, I assume. Now, uh, I might have been wrong about thinking the pale haired person is Sauron. It might be, it might not be, because apparently there are several candidates for Sauron. Some say Halbrand might be Sauron. I buy him more as Sauron, actually, as Anatar, than the bland and blonde person. We shall see, I suppose. If this were its own show, with the courage to be its own, own distinct thing, I would give it perhaps between a 5 and a 6 out of 10 for those first two episodes. But it is not because, again, Amazon decided they needed to ride on the coattails of Tolkien and his writing. This is between a 3 and a 4 out of 10 for me. On the level of Annihilation, again, I don't care that Annihilation kind of works as a horror movie, they decided to call it Annihilation and based off of Jeff Vanamir's novel. And it was an abysmally garbage adaptation. So it's on that same level for me. Not quite Game of Thrones season 8 tier or Aragon tier, but kind of just above that. So 3 to 4 out of 10 for me. So <laughs> it's going to be interesting watching the rest of this. But I will do it for you all. <laughs> So on that note, <laughs> if you want to share thoughts, please feel free to do so, or on the Discord, there's a link for it in the description box down below. <laughs> in the meantime, I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves, thank you for the continued support, send me energy vibes <laughs> so I can make it through this season. Uh, I shall see you all uh, reasonably soon in another video, but until then, bye bye